So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about neurons and how they actually generate electrical signals. So neurons or nerve cells generate electrical signals to allow them to be able to communicate with other structures in the body, with other nerve cells, with other organs, with muscle cells, with glands. They have to generate these electrical signals to allow them to be able to communicate. Before we can get into how these electrical signals are generated, we need to review a concept that we talked about with skeletal muscle cells, and that is the concept of membrane potential. So you may remember from when we talked about skeletal muscle cells that membrane potential is referring to a difference in charge on the two sides of the cell membrane or the two sides of the plasma membrane. And you may also remember that with skeletal muscle cells, the difference in charge on the two sides of the membrane is that the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside of the cell. One last thing that's important to remember as we're kind of reviewing this concept and getting ready to apply it to what's going on with nerve cells is the idea that changes in membrane potential are what triggers a skeletal muscle cell to contract. So you may remember that skeletal muscle cells at rest have this difference on the two sides of the membrane. They have this membrane potential that's equal to negative 70 millivolts. However, when we need a skeletal muscle cell to contract, we're going to do something that causes that membrane potential to change. So we open up sodium channels, sodium rushes into the cell that makes the inside less negative. It makes it start to become more positive. So it makes the inside more like the outside. So it's not polar anymore. Basically, we depolarize the cell. And that's the signal that tells a skeletal muscle cell to contract. So with those things in mind, here's a few things that you should know about nerve cells or neurons. They also have a membrane potential. And the membrane potential that we see with these nerve cells is exactly the same as what we see with skeletal muscle cells. So they are negative on the inside relative to the outside. And the difference on the two sides of the membrane is negative 70 millivolts, just like what we saw with the skeletal muscle cells. The other thing that you should know is that these nerve cells also can be signaled to do something through changes in membrane potential, just like a skeletal muscle cell is. So what I wanna do with these ideas being established is talk a little bit about a couple of different types of change in membrane potential that we'll see with nerve cells. And to be able to do that, I'm first gonna draw kind of just a simplified picture of a nerve or a nerve cell. So here is my axon. There's the terminal branches, synaptic knobs out here at the end of that axon. This is my cell body up in here. I'm going to draw my nucleus in, or what's also known as the soma. A couple of dendrites that I'm going to add onto here. It's a really simplified drawing of a neuron. And the couple of different types of changes in membrane potential that we see are what are known as graded potentials and action potentials. So graded potentials are changes in membrane potential that are happening in the area of the dendrites and sometimes the soma. So these are changes in membrane potential that are happening out in these areas where I've just circled. If a graded potential is happening in the area of the dendrites, we're getting basically a wave-like change in the membrane potential that's going to travel down a dendrite or down the dendrites toward the cell body in the direction that I've drawn this arrow. Action potentials are changes in membrane potential that are happening out in the area of the axon. And when we see action potentials happening, these are wave-like changes in membrane potential that are traveling down the axon in this direction. So they're traveling away from the cell body. So what I wanna do now that we've kind of established what action potentials are and where they're happening and what graded potentials are and where they're happening is talk about, first of all, what would cause a graded potential and then get into how a graded potential can be used to initiate an action potential. It's the action potentials 
that travel down the axon, that travel away from a nerve cell, that allow these nerve cells or these neurons to communicate with other cells of the body, with skeletal muscle cells, with organs, with glands, those kinds of things. So before we can ever have an action potential, we first need to have a graded potential. And I'm going to, again, draw just a really simplified representation of a neuron or a nerve cell. Here's my dendrites out here. I've got my cell body and my, and my axon drawn in. And the first thing that you should know is before we can get an action potential, before we can get one of those changes in membrane potential that travels like a wave down the axon to allow our nerve cell to be able to communicate with another cell, we first have to have a graded potential develop. And what causes a graded potential to develop is a change or stimulus that occurs in the neuron's environment. So when we're talking about a change or a stimulus that's occurring in a neuron's environment, the dendrites are the receptors for a neuron. So this would be a change that's happening out here, kind of in this area um, that I've outlined for you in red. And when we're talking about a stimulus occurring or a change in the neuron's environment occurring, I'm using those terms interchangeably, this could be for example, a change in temperature, if this is a neuron in the skin, or a change in pressure. So if somebody pushes on your skin, you can feel that because there's a change in pressure in the environment of neurons in the skin. If we're talking about neurons in the eye, this could be a change in light. So maybe light has entered the eye, that's gonna change the environment of neurons in the eye and cause graded potentials in those areas. It could be a change in the chemical environment of a neuron. So really any kind of change in the environment of a neuron happening out here in the area of the dendrites, which are the receptors for our neuron or for our nerve cell, is going to initiate a graded potential. So if you look at this slide over here, what we're seeing in this diagram is an artist's representation of a neuron. Here's our axon. It's been kind of truncated just so we can fit this all on here. Cell body or soma, where our nucleus would be. And then we've got several dendrites that are attached onto this particular neuron. And remember, when we are having a stimulus or a change that's occurring in the environment of a neuron, our dendrites are our receptors for the neuron. So that's gonna be a change or a stimulus that's happening in the area of the dendrites. And when we get a change that happens in the area of the dendrites, what it causes to happen, no matter what kind of change it is, electrical change, chemical change, temperature change, pressure change, light change, whatever, what it causes to happen is that sodium channels that line this area out here of the dendrites are going to start to open up. And if we have a high intensity stimulus, so let's say it was a pressure change, if it was a high pressure, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get a lot of sodium channels opening. And if the intensity of the stimulus was less, so if we're talking about pressure, if maybe somebody just gently brushed you or maybe a tiny little insect and it landed on your skin, that's not a high pressure. Um, and in those cases, we don't have as many sodium channels opening in the area of the dendrites. So depending on the intensity of the stimulus, we will get more or less sodium channels opening. That is a really important concept for you to understand. The more intense the stimulus, the more sodium channels that open. The less intense the stimulus, the less sodium channels open. Here's why that particular idea is important. So if we go to this next slide over here, okay, graded potentials can be of two types. They can be what are known as threshold graded potentials, which we'll talk about in a moment, or they can be subthreshold graded potentials. So I wanna actually talk about what happens in a subthreshold graded potential first. So I've got some stuff listed about it here um, on the bottom of this slide under subthreshold depolarization. 
And to go along with that, I've got this picture here of a subthreshold depolarization. So what I want you to notice with this picture here, we've got a neuron that's represented. This is supposed to be the synaptic knob of another neuron that's in close proximity. So this here as well, um, we've got the synaptic knob of another neuron that's in close proximity. And what you'll notice about these synaptic knobs is that they are releasing these little blue dots, okay, which are meant to represent some chemical neurotransmitter onto this cell body of this neuron here. So this is a neurotransmitter, it's a chemical, and as we're releasing that neurotransmitter or that chemical into the environment of this neuron, that's changing the chemical environment of the neuron. So because we're changing the chemical environment of this neuron, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have some sodium channels out here in the area of the dendrites in the area of the cell body are going to start to open. You'll notice we've got just a couple of synaptic knobs that are releasing just a little bit of neurotransmitter and that's causing a couple of sodium channels to open up on the cell body of this neuron here. That's going to allow a little bit of sodium to rush into the cell. So we've got this positive charge that's coming into the cell through these two open sodium channels and that's going to make the inside of the cell a little bit less negative. It's going to make it a little bit closer to what we've got as far as charge on the outside of the cell. So we're going to depolarize the cell to some extent when that sodium starts to come in. However, the amount of sodium that comes in is going to be dependent on how many sodium channels that are open. And because we have just a couple of sodium channels open, this wasn't a very intense stimulus, we're not going to depolarize the cell a lot. In this case, it says that we're going from a difference of negative 70 millivolts to, if you can see this number right here, negative 62 millivolts. So we've become a little bit less negative on the inside. Um, we've become about 8 millivolts less negative going from negative 70 to negative 62. This is what's known as a subthreshold depolarization. We have to hit a threshold depolarization of negative 55 millivolts. Otherwise, our graded potential will just die out, which means eventually these sodium channels close, sodium stops coming in, we stop depolarizing it, and the sodium potassium pumps take us right back to our resting membrane potential without an action potential ever having been generated. So if that's the case with a subthreshold depolarization, we don't get an action potential generated, this neuron does not pass on, it does not communicate the fact that there was a change in its environment. So no other cell, no other part of the body becomes aware of that change. What we will sometimes see happening instead is what's known as a threshold depolarization. So up here at, on the top, I've got some things listed about a threshold depolarization. And over here, we've got a diagram that kind of explains what's going on with a threshold level depolarization. So I want you to focus here on this neuron for a bit. You'll notice in this case, we've got three synaptic knobs, all of which are releasing neurotransmitter onto this cell. So we've got more neurotransmitter being released than we did previously with the previous cell, and that's going to cause more sodium channels to open because remember, a more intense stimulus leads to more sodium channels opening. So in this case, again, really simplified representation, but the artist is showing us that our stimulus was intense enough in this case that three sodium channels opened instead of two. And now we've got three areas where sodium is rushing into the cell. And that sodium, of course, is a positive charge. And as we've got positive charge moving into the inside of the cell, it's going to make the inside of the cell less negative than it was previously. In this case, we have a threshold level depolarization. So our stimulus was intense enough that enough sodium channels opened, but enough sodium entered to take us from a membrane potential of negative 70 to a membrane potential of, again, if you can see this picture right here, negative 55 millivolts. Negative 55 is our threshold level. If we are able to depolarize the cell to negative 55, 
because our stimulus was intense enough, enough sodium channels opened, and enough sodium entered, then what will happen next is sodium channels in the area of the axon hillock. So this is that area that's also sometimes referred to as the trigger zone. Sodium channels in that area will spontaneously open and it will cause a depolarization in the axon hillock. When this area depolarizes, it causes the initial segment of the axons for the sodium channels there to open, which depolarizes that, which causes the next area of the axon to have sodium potentials open, which depolarizes that area. And you get this wave of depolarization that travels down the axon away from the neuron. So we get an action potential being triggered if we hit that threshold level of negative 55 millivolts. And that action potential, you'll remember, is what allows our neuron to be able to communicate with the neck cell or the skeletal muscle or the organ or the gland that it's actually hooked up to. So you may be wondering, why do we have subthreshold depolarizations and why do we sometimes have threshold depolarizations? If a change happens in a neuron's environment, isn't it always important enough to be communicated to the rest of the body? And the reality is no, it's not. And having these subthreshold level depolarizations is really adaptive to our health and well being because it prevents us from being alerted in our bodies to every single thing that's going on. Let me give you an example of this. If you are standing in like hurricane winds, they are going to be exerting a lot of pressure on the neurons in your skin. And because it's such a high intensity stimulus, because there is so much pressure being put on the skin from those really high winds, you're going to have a lot of sodium channels open, which is going to cause threshold level depolarization. And a signal is going to be sent to the brain, alerting you to the fact that you have a lot of pressure from your skin from these really high force winds. And that's important to know, right? Because hurricanes are dangerous and you need to be able to seek shelter and protect yourself. And being able to fill those high winds is going to allow you to be able to do that. When you're sitting in your house or when you're sitting outside on a cool day, air currents are always circulating around you. However, the air is moving so slowly, that it's putting so little pressure on your skin it's probably not something that you would want to be aware of. And if you were constantly aware of the air currents that were circulating around you or other really low intensity stimuli that just aren't important, your sweater on your wrist or your hair tie that's pulling your hair back if you have long hair, those kinds of things would drive you crazy to be aware of every little change, every little thing that's going on all the time. So when we have these low intensity stimuli that really aren't important, they're going to get filtered out and they're not going to get converted into action potentials. And that's going to happen again because with the low intensity stimulus, we don't have as many sodium channels opening. We don't get the same level of depolarization. It's the sub threshold and that graded potential just dies out without causing an action potential that's going to alert the rest of the body to what's actually going on.